about towels in the 1890s in, in the Paris art school from Joseph Sharp. We were both interested in Indians and he told me that if I went out west to, to be sure and see towels. Then when we planned, Bert Phillips and I planned to come west and paint Indians, make a trip from Denver to Mexico, we included towels in our itinerary. In those days, the roads were simply terrible, and this was just after the rainy season when they were at their worst. Well, we were very green, and, and, and so we just went on. Eventually, we reached a place about, oh, about 25 miles from Taos in, in the foothills of the mountains, and we heard this terrible crash as, as our back wheel completely collapsed. Well, one of us had to take the wheel on a horse all the way to Taos, and we didn't know what a fateful adventure this, this was to turn out to be. The next morning, I started out, and it was... I, I'll never forget that morning in my life. I, I was about 23 years old, and my experience in art had, had been mostly from, well, from other people's experiences. That is to say that their pictures and their recordings of what they felt and, and, and what they saw. But in this particular trip, as I, I sat on that horse carrying that wheel, the, the whole thing was so, was so inspiring. And, and I realized that I was getting my, my very own impressions of something that nobody had ever described to me. And when I got there and saw the Indians in their white robes, very impressive. So all in all, by the time that wheel was fixed, I had just about made up my mind that we had gone far enough, that, that this was the place we were looking for. That was in 1898. Phillips and Blumenshine, uh, as they talked to their friends back east, more and more of them came west to see what 
they were talking about and painting about. And as they came and raved about it also and decided to stay and paint the rest of their lives, they formed in 1912 the Tau Society of Artists, which was uniquely an American group. They were tired of the European influence and they were great admirers of the Indians and the Spanish Americans here. The fresh material, of course, helped them tremendously to put over this American scene. There was no radio, no TV. They loved to talk, and they would come often to our house and literally talk by the hour. They were fascinating to hear, and my childhood is full of these memories. The Indians in those days must have been very colorful. They had wonderful hawk-like faces, and if we see some of the old photos in the Harwood archives, these people looked like Bedouins, swathed to the eyes in their blankets on these horses. The early painters, the seven pintores of Taos, and those who followed them, uh, <coughs> used as one of their two chief motifs the Indians and Aspens. That was their stock in trade for years. The Rio Grande and Santa Fe Railroad picked them up and used them to advertise their, their trips through the region. And these posters were widely circulated and became quite well known. They were, of course, overly sentimental, very sentimental, but they were very popular. One of the artists, Kaus, was employed to make a poster every year. Now, those paintings of the Taos Society of Art artists that was formed in those early days, about 1914, as I recollect, went all over the world. These paintings were sent back east showings in all big cities in the United States, and there was even one or two showings in Europe and one showing in Shanghai, China.
And Mabel sent down, uh, there were a couple of cars in town, sent one of them down to meet us at the train. It's Bobby Jones and I. Robert Edmund Jones made the sets for the Russian ballet. That was 19, late 1917, I think. And you said that when you arrived in Taos, it looked like the first day of creation. I did? Yes, in your writing. Well, <laughs> maybe it did, because I don't know what the first day of creation was like. <laughs> what did Taos seem like to you when you first saw it? Well, the, the, the vastness the vastness of the country because I was used to a place like Woodstock where everything is rather narrow and tight. The Taos influenced my art only insofar as the landscape may have influenced it, but certainly not a, any kind of an influence such as you found in Paris at the time with Picasso, Cezanne, rock those men. It's very different. Did you ever work in Paris? Oh yes, I worked there in 1910. Dasberg, who's now 92, he just turned 92 I think last he's month. 92, yeah. And still producing? Yes, well of course uh, his fame came in the, in an army show in uh, 1913 in New York. He was a very young man. It was most remarkable how, uh, well he was very excited about Cezanne. He discovered Cezanne and Van Gogh mm -hmm. and brought that uh, heritage to New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, uh, he probably was one of the earliest uh, uh, modern artists that came to this part of the country, bringing the message from Europe really to, uh, to this part of the world. Mm -hmm. I think we could put them in two categories. Uh, one, the people who stayed in Taos, and then those who came through, worked here, painted some time, and then went on. And there are so many famous names which are, are incredible when one comes, comes to think of it. Well, John Sloan, of course, was probably uh, the most important. He came every summer for years and years and years, and he helped found the uh, Museum of New Mexico. That's the right. art museum. Did Robert Henry have a lot to do with that too? Henry, yes. As a matter of fact, the museum has many of his works. And Marin, John Marin. Not so long ago, there was a show of the Taos paintings of Ma John Marin yeah. that I saw down yeah. in Albuquerque. Yeah. Then, of course, uh, the, the strangest uh, name of all that I've ever heard was Frederick Remington. I never yeah. knew that he came this Remington. far to the, to the southwest here. Did you paint with John Marin in New Mexico? Paint? Yeah, go out with Oh, him. occasionally we went sketching and fishing. I think we did more fishing together than sketching. Why did I come to New Mexico? I know why I came to New Mexico, because Mabel Dodge came here. She was married to Maurice Stern at the time, and he had come out here and uh, apparently liked it. So she followed, and when she got here, she said, it's a wonderful place. I want you and Bobby to come and bring me a cook. That's Bobby Jones. So we brought her a cook. Yes, Mabel was responsible for bringing him here, and uh, she uh, brought many notable people. It would take, take a full biography. Uh, she went to Europe and met uh, an architect called Dodge and married him, and for many years they lived in a villa in Florence, Italy. She then came to New York and moved her salon and accumulated a great number of famous people. Then she married Maurice Stern and came with him to Taos and fell in love with Tony Lujan, an Indian at Taos Pueblo. Divorced Stern and they were married and built their big house, as it was called, plus 
six other small guest houses on the property. Of course, being in a remote so-called primitive area like Taos, there was no, not much companionship here. So she brought and attracted all of these people from all over the country, all over the world. And I think it was due to her magnetism, because she did have an undoubted magnetism, put Taos on the map. This is the D.H. Lawrence collection that was banned in, in England in 1929 at the Warren Galleries. After a two-week exhibition, it was banned by Scotland Yard, and the paintings were returned on the uh, strength that they would never be returned to England, because at one time they threatened to uh, burn them. Since that time, they have never been exhibited anywhere except in this office. And this collection I purchased from uh, the late husband of Frida Lawrence, Angelina Ravagli, in 1956. And my main interest was that uh, the late Aga Khan, father of Ali Khan, and one of the uh, Rothschilds attempted to purchase this collection in the late 20s. But Frida Lawrence refused to part with them at that time. After uh, Frida's death, Angelino Ravagli was uh, negotiating with a collector from Switzerland. And there was a breakdown in negotiations. So I said to him, why don't you sell them to me and I can exhibit them in Taos? And uh, he said to me, do you think that you could raise the money to buy them? And I said, well, that's what they have banks for, you know. So that was that. Lawrence always thought he could do things better than anybody else. So he always painted on my paintings if he could. And we would sit in the big field, you know the big field up there? And uh, paint. Now I did one of the desert over that way, you see, upon which we all painted. And we all did a bit on that. I tell you, Frida did the white chickens. And Lawrence <laughs> uh, helped, uh, you know, with the uh, horses and I think we're riding, aren't we? I painted the horses huh? and uh, the southern landscape too. And then he painted the uh, mountains in the sky. But he all, I tell you, Lawrence always thought he could do better. So he started painting on them. Mabel was a very powerful woman, somewhat bossy, you know and extremely intelligent, extremely well-read. And she liked having uh, in intellectual people, uh, you know, to visit. And Mabel wanted to give them the ranch, and Frieda accepted it. And they went up there to stay. Then I went up, Lawrence would work in the mornings, under, sitting under his tree with his copybook. And then in the afternoons, we rode. Just rode around, you know, the mountains and the hills here. And it was then 
that I'd learned so much about the Indians. I learned to know them from their attitude about themselves. I painted some of the big ceremonies, but because they don't allow them to be photographed. The paintings I have done are practically the only record of them. I think they come from dreams and visions, and then they're made into a ceremonial dance so that the people can join in to this uh, vision and this dream. I met Georgia down here for the first time. I was going to the Santa Domingo corn dance. And of course, there was uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, the greatest uh, painter of the Southwest. Well, she used to come uh, over to Taos more often. Perhaps she comes still, I don't know, but when Brett was alive, they were great friends and she came over quite often. I see. Uh, I think when she came first to New Mexico, which was a long time ago, uh, she painted a cross of the Morada that's behind Mabel Dodge Lujan's house. That's right. I believe that was her first cross that she painted in New Mexico. During the 30s and 40s, the hotel, as well as the coffee shop, was a gathering place for the artists and writers. They would come in and have coffee and then play chess. And uh, my father would give a feast once a year for the painters and writers. We were a very interesting group of painters at that time with uh, their background. Walter Woofer, Sharp, Kaus, Blumenshine, Higgins from London, Paris, New York, men like uh, Fashion, who's one of the great Russian painters of this century. Also, Gaspar, who lived in Paris for many years and was a flyer, and after he was shot down uh, during World War I, he came to Taos to Carmeles. The phrase, La Boheme of the Rockies, uh, was one of Leon Gaspard's. Leon Gaspard, of course, was a Russian who was born in uh, Russia, and then at the turn of the century, about 1898, he went to study art in Paris, which was the real La Boheme, the great days of, of early uh, impressionistic art. Now, when he came here, he found in a small place like this, he found well-known, professional, successful artists from London, like John Young Hunter, the portrait painter who studied with Whistler, and uh, a fellow Russian, Nikolai Feshin, and uh, Gaspar, and uh, Dasberg, who was born in France, and Brett, who came from England, and people of all nationalities. So this was really in, uh, a metropolitan bohème in the Rockies. This was a place where individualism was unrestrained. It was not like a big city. It was a small, remote place in an early time, and all of these foreign-born people could express themselves without restraint. And I have always thought this is so because we not only had very fine artists with different mores, but we had all of the pseudo-artists that followed them, uh, who would go to uh, uh, an art school in New York for a summer, and then would hike to Taos, put on a beret, and have a long cigarette holder and call themselves artists and cut a wide swath. Taos lives on its past and is merely a legend. None of these things are ever stationary, you know. I came simply because uh, Lawrence uh, and Frieda came and they wanted to bring a group of us out. And I was the only one that came, the all the rest backed out.
I'm reading from one of my father's letters. We all drifted into Taos like skilled hands, looking for a good, steady job. We found it, and it grew into an urge that pushed us to our limits. We lived only to paint, and that is what happened to every artist who passed this way. I think that Taos is just, a, just a, an echo of the rest of the world. Everybody that learns anything from anywhere else eventually lands in Taos and produces what he's learned. For that reason, many are just imitations of other schools, but we have made a tremendous reputation all over the world, this little town of Taos. <laughs> 